first let me begin with Julius. Mm -hmm. uh, Julius published, or excuse me, wrote this dissertation and it was completed in 1986. It has had this extraordinary underground life among scholars for um, many years that's since over, then. That's over 30 years ago. That's 30 years ago, <laughs> that is right. That's a long time ago. We're dating ourselves. Uh, Julius is a lecturer in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan. Uh, and I think uh, we're here to celebrate him and his that's work. Right. Okay. Uh, Robin Kelly is the Gary B. Nash Professor of History at UCLA. Robin is the author of many extraordinary books, one of them uh, which is called Hammer and Ho, uh, Alabama Communist During the Great Depression. Uh, one of my graduate students are reading that in two weeks. Uh, it's, it's a classic work. Robin also wrote a wonderful collection called Race Rebels. Uh, another book, I always just simply like saying the title, it's called Yo Mama's Dysfunctional. <laughs> and, and the funk is F-U-N-K in the title. Uh, he wrote a, a prize-winning uh, biography of Thelonious Monk. Uh, he's, uh, and, and my favorite is uh, uh, Freedom Dreams, the Black Radical Imagination. Robin is also uh, a leading public intellectual he is one of the sharpest critics and discussants of contemporary uh, movements from below, and especially, I would say, Black Lives Matter. So a special welcome to you, Robin. Thank you. Uh, Peter Linebaugh, as you know, is my friend and comrade for 40 years. We wrote a book together called The Many Headed Hydra. Uh, Peter is also the author of many books and uh, very influential essays. He wrote The London Hanged, Crime and Civil Society in the 18th Century, uh, an extraordinary work of uh, social history. He wrote uh, the Magna Carta Manifesto, uh, which has had a very big impact internationally. And I'm happy to say he has recently finished a new book called Red Round Globe Hot Burning. That's from William Blake. The subtitle is Ned and Kate's Struggle for the Commons. It's, it's, a, it's an account not only of uh, Edward Marcus Despard and Catherine Despard, uh, an Irish and African American revolutionary, and their times in the early 18th century, but it really is a book that is profoundly about the modern period. Peter has played a very important role in the international discussion and debate of the commons, past, present, and future. So we're very happy to have not only Julius, but really I think two of the most important thinkers in this historical moment in Robin and Peter. So with that, I'll turn okay. it over to Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I wrote something because I know 15 minutes is a short time, um, but before I say anything, um, I just have to say what an honor it is to be here back at Pitt, which is one of the great institutions of all time, uh, with three scholars who taught me basically everything I know. Um, I could prove it. You know, if you want, I could demonstrate it. Um, so it's a true, truly great event, the publication of Julia Scott's The Common Wind, Currents of Afro-American Communications in the Era of the Haitian Revolution. Um, I have known Julius since 1988, so he kind of beat me there by three years. Um, he is... Uh, you know, was one year ahead of me. I finished my dissertation in 87, he finished in 86. Uh, we met in North Carolina, I was a fellow there. Um, and he's my daughter's uh, godfather, and he loves this music as much as I do. Um, he, he was the first person I walked in his house, he had as many albums that could fill up this whole room. <laughs> but albums are, you know, albums. <laughs> <laughs> So when we met, you know, it had been two years since he had completed the dissertation, and it really did establish Julius as one of the founders of the field of modern Atlantic history. I know that's a lot to say, but I would make that argument. I mean, he helped, literally helped create this field, along with people um, in front of you. Um, everyone working on slavery in the Atlantic world in the era of bourgeois democratic revolutions um, has mined this incredible dissertation. Uh, it's an amazing resource. It borrowed from its conceptual framework to the best of their ability. And yet, um, I think few have come to recognize the political implications in the genuinely revolutionary nature 
of the arguments he's making. Um, I'll say a little bit about that toward the end, and you're going to hear some of that from Peter in particular. Over the course of the past three decades, virtually everyone agreed, from David Brian Davis to Winthrop Jordan to Marcus and others, that this work is a tour de force. Following the best traditions of C.L.R. James, W.B. Du Bois, Eric Williams, E.P. Thompson, the common wind demonstrates precisely how enslaved and free black people across the hemisphere spread news about liberty, particularly events unfolding in San Domingue, but not just that, not just that, there's more to it. Um, Julius uh, reconstructs these elaborate networks of communication through archival research, which was nothing short of heroic. Uh, when Marcus asked the question, how do you do that? When you follow the footnotes, you could see how we did it, and it just, in other words, he had to deal with at least three, maybe four languages, Spanish, French, English, um, and, and follow people wherever they went, finding the most mi minuscule bits of information. Um, and in fact, a lot of the archives he used were North America, Europe, the Caribbean, and Latin America. So it's not the kind of thing that we typically tell our graduate students to do. Like, you know, it's like the only, the only other person I knew who was a graduate student who, who did a, a project like that, uh, but from a different field, is Cedric Robinson, who just told his advisors, I'm basically going to critique the whole field of political science. <laughs> and that was his dissertation. Um, so that's, in some ways, the, 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 the gravity of this work is similar to that. Um, this, in, in and of itself, is an amazing feat, but what's more astounding is uh, his ability to pull all this disparate material together in order to create a really beautifully written, coherent narrative that forces readers to rethink the creation of New World Republicanism, systems of communication in the 18th and early 19th century, the political and cultural autonomy of African peoples in the West, and the crucial role that black sailors play in the age of democratic revolutions. Now, as sailors, they shared a political culture of dissent. No one knows this better than, than Marcus, who spent his whole life writing about sailors and pirates, and those were part of this. They had worldly knowledge, thanks to their mobility. Um, theirs was a political culture that cut across lines of race and nationality, which in turn forced colonial states and, and the metropoles to pass laws that deliberately sought to drive a wedge between European sailors from um, uh, European sailors on one hand and local enslaved and free black people on the other. And this is one of the arguments that Julius makes in, in his text. Now rereading it after all these years, I think the last time I read it cover to cover was 1996, I was struck uh, by uh, Julius's vivid portrait of what he refers to as the masterless people. Mm. Uh, the masterless people during the early years of the Caribbean settlement. The rebellious the unruly class of pirates and buccaneers, maroons, other fugitives, uh, people who refused to be tamed and could only be subdued through force and control of a settler colonial order, which wasn't in place at first. <coughs> this theme of masterlessness as social practice and um, vision of horizontal power uh, was much clearer to me upon reading it again. Now, maybe it has to do with where we are. Uh, indeed, long before Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic, Scott invoked the sailing image, both literally and metaphorically, to illustrate how networks of oral transmission and shared memory were the crucial dimensions of Afro-diasporic politics and identity. The common wind carried a radical anti-slavery, antinomian, leveling vision of republicanism, an emancipatory vision that had it succeeded, would have redirected the modern world in ways that Du Bois had imagined in Black Reconstruction. You know, it was defeated though, and this is important. Um, not forever, because of course history hasn't ended yet. You know that, right? <laughs> We're still in it, no matter what people say. Um, so, in other words, the the characters in Julius's book not only spread news and information, they spread ideas. Ideas about revolution. And ideas don't travel by drum. Just remember that, because this, this is kind of romanticization, like these spread ideas that, that, that communication takes place through the drum. These, these were ideas. These were debates. Sometimes it was in the form of pamphlets memorized. 
Sometimes people took on names like John Payne, right? Um, Scott makes the crucial contribution that it was precisely the circulation of ideas in people across the Western Hemisphere in the Caribbean Basin, not just in miseration and repression, that gave birth to significant political movements and currents such as abolition republicanism, pan-Africanism, and new often suppressed expressions uh, uh, of, of um, expressions of internationalism. In many ways, the common wind carried a vision of the future world far more radical than anything being pursued in Paris or Philadelphia. That's right. This really is the essence of the common win. Mm. The unruly Atlantic working classes who seem to be always in a state of fugitivity. And I, and I just want to remind us, too, that if you haven't read the text, um, Certainly, black sailors are central, but that's not the whole story. This is actually about this broader Atlantic working class. And there are lots of people involved in this project of both spreading information and news and ideas, but also resisting the current order. The level of mobility and descent was spectacular, especially among those of African descent, because they were the most surveilled and most policed. And they were not all sailors. The dangerous classes included higglers, peddlers, uh, the white deserters from the military, military musicians he talks about, um, unruly Irishmen and the like. The characters in the book defy common tropes and stereotypes. In fact, I would say that a figure like Jean-Louis um, is one of the characters that come way more interesting than, than Hamilton. Like, Alexander Hamilton is okay, but a, a play on John Louis would be so fantastic. There's just so much more interesting, that's just me. Um, so networks of communication required cooperation, mobility, secrecy, and organization. Slave power was always on the defensive, even as it reaped the profits of sugar production, and though, and though it never really succeeded at stamping out these networks. If anything, one learns from the common win how the Africans exercise a level of power that's inconceivable today. Um, maroon societies coexisted in a world where plantation slaves were so frequently absent and owners and overseers so powerless to control them that they wouldn't even uh, delete absent slaves from the plantation list. One of the absurdities uh, created by the situation that Julius writes about is how the Spanish and French and English authorities and Republicans worked hard to suppress information and slogans because they knew that people were listening and they, they would spread this information. They feared it would incite rebellion among the enslaved. Some tried uh, uh, to wage revolutions while whispering and tiptoeing around the enslaved and it never worked out. News blackouts didn't work out. They were, you know, they were implemented but ultimately failed. There are many things to admire about the book and even more so when we realize that most of the scholarship still hasn't caught up. Mm. For example, by following these networks of communication, uh, Julius found that there was no discrete, bounded English Atlantic or Spanish Atlantic mm -hmm. or Portuguese Atlantic. It just didn't exist. Um, these new and old world Africans moved through all empires, uh, through all languages. Maroons coordinated insurrections across uh, language and some examples that he gives. Um, he reminds us that uh, Mackendal and Buchmann both escaped from Jamaica, mm -hmm. and Henri uh, Christophe was born in the British island of St. Kitts. Uh, noted, too, that the insurrection of the enslaved in eastern Cuba, uh, the Cobreros, coincided um, and presumably was coordinated with the first Maroon War in Jamaica in 1731. Now, this is not to say that all empires were undifferentiated, but rather that African rebels were no respecter of nations. Mm. Okay. Finally, what are the implications for today's debates about liberalism, slavery, the human, and more recently, what might be called the Afro-pessimist term? Okay? Um, I have a plane to catch at 8.05, so if people want to fight me about Afro-pessimism, you may have to catch me running to the airport. Um, <laughs> So we'll see, because I know we'll have to have a fight about that. But first, on the first issue, uh, Sylvia Winter and much later Patrick Wolfe and Lisa Lowe and many, many others have insightfully argued that revolutionary ideals of liberty depended on slavery as a condition of possibility. 
enslaving Africans free poor whites for the more egregious forms of coercion and allowed those same slave owners to condemn slavery in the name of liberalism and in the same breath because Africans were excluded from the category of the human. Now, I don't disagree with those arguments, um, but the common win, again, points to an alternative vision of liberty, a, an alternative vision of liberty that ultimately was defeated. In other words, the Enlightenment idea that slavery was a condition of possibility for liberty was not a fait accompli. And I think that's one of the key lessons here. On the second point, I read the common win as a powerful answer to the Afro-pessimist term. And by Afro-pessimism, um, I mean the baffling analytical term that strips black people of political agency, denies the saliency of class and class struggle, and most of all, forecloses the possibility of cross-racial, ethnic, national solidarity. So a particular variant of Afro-pessimism views the modern world founded on anti-black solidarity. Um, and blackness, relegated to, based on a reading of Fanon, uh, relegated to the zone of non-human, uh, non-beings, to the terrain of the non-communicable, to a permanent social death pre predicated on modalities of accumulation and fungibility. So in this formulation, black people are rendered subhuman or non-human and thus have no history. Anti-blackness is foundational, universal, axiomatic, and therefore forecloses the possibility of solidarity. The problem is that no one told the characters in Julius' <laughs> book that they were not human. They saw themselves as human. Not only that, but they saw themselves as worthy of liberty. They saw that their enslavement was a crime, a crime against themselves, against humanities, and against humanity, and more importantly, they were the harbingers of a new era of freedom. And there were elements among the masterless who believed the same and acted, okay? Even if they were not black, who believed the same and acted toward that kind of liberty. Ultimately, the common win is a story of a defeat. It doesn't end that way, but it's a story of a defeat but a, a temporary defeat yes. or a process. Think of it as a struggle. Uh, and it ends, the epilogue sort of ends with uh, the continuing memory of Toussaint, always coming back. Um, a movement to seize liberty across the entire hemisphere, um, to create the masterless world. But it wasn't, it was not just outgunned, but part of the temporary defeat of that masterless world was the consolidation of the white settler colonial project. And this is why the Haitian Revolution, one could argue, argue played uh, a key role in extending democracy to the white work classes in North America. In other words, the creation of Herringbolt democracy or what Alexander Saxon calls the, the white republic, um, which is part of the continuing project of splitting, splitting the masterless classes. So with that, I'll end there and we'll hear from Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, thanks, Robin. Thanks, Marcus. Julius. Uh, it means a lot for me to be here. Last time I was here, uh, I, I just want to remember uh, People have gone before me here and have right. now left us Steve Sapolsky and Dave Montgomery and uh, Edward Thompson. And the last time I was here, uh, 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 what's his name? Dennis. Dennis, 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 Dennis Brutus mm -hmm. yeah. uh, was here. So uh, in the presence of the, those shades, uh, I'm looking to the future uh, with, with you all. And I want to speak about the significance of the common wind. And here I'm talking, uh, and, and I wrote a, a piece that's way too long, uh, uh, but there's some things, so I'm going to try to summarize and speak uh, extemporaneously to a degree. But Robin mentioned Alexander Hamilton, and I, I want to say something about Hamilton. But first, I've got August 1791, taken as the, the night that the Haitian Revolt begins, and the 1st of January, 1804, that's uh, Haitian uh, independence. But I, I kind of see the Haitian victory being in 1803 in that, that fall. Mm -hmm. uh, 1802 is a, a debate, is a date I want you all to, to remember. 
uh, for this purpose, and I'll say right away why. Uh, <clears throat> in 1802, more slaves were embarked on British ships than ever before in human history. That same year, 1802, more acts of enclosure of land in England were passed than ever before in human history. So for me, the challenge is to see these in relationship to the era of the Haitian Revolution. And the key to that is the common wind. I think that's, that's my theme that I would like uh, to develop. Of course, it's a great title. Uh, you know, Bob Dylan's got a song, The Caribbean Wind, that I won't quote. And you all might know about some movie called The Gone with the Wind. <laughs> it's taken from a poet, an English decadent poet from the 1890s, uh, who just wanted to forget the past and live in nostalgia. <laughs> Gone with the wind. <laughs> the common wind is the exact opposite to forgetting. It's calling on us to remember. And it's hard for us to do that, I believe, because, as Robin said, that defeat is not over. The battle is not finished. This dissertation, this book, begins with a poem, which I'm going to quote. It's a sonnet. Sonnet is in 14 lines. And the the first page of this book begins with the second of the seven lines. It's referring to Toussaint Louverture. Though fallen thyself never to rise again, live and take comfort. Thou hast left behind powers that will work for thee, air, earth, skies. There's not a breathing of the common wind that will forget thee. Thou hast great allies. Thy friends are exaltations, agonies, and love, and man's unconquerable mind. Julia Scott asks us to interpret the common wind as the exaltation, agony, love, and unconquerable mind of the masterless people of the Caribbean in the freedom struggle. Now, you and I cannot forget the common wind either, either, for it carried, it was carried by a revolutionary subject whose object has not yet been attained. And I am moved to be here with Marcus, Julius, and Robin, and with you. on the project of fulfilling that and attaining the object that seemed to have been defeated in this project of revolutionary remembrance. When Wordsworth, you know, we, we were taught, or I was taught to look at Wordsworth as, as different metaphors. I'm not looking at the common wind as a metaphor. Today. I'm looking at the common wind as a revolutionary subject. It's not a metaphor or a symbol for something else. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on that. Wordsworth it has an idealist meaning of earth, sky, and sea as receptacles of human projections, which then signify back to human social life attributes which otherwise could not be observed. So we need such metaphors and symbols to see what we're about. That's, that's what I get from quoting Wordsworth at the beginning. That's what I, I get from it. This book is written with an authority. The prose is clear, persuasive, and owing to understatement in the face of great crimes, it is oddly calming as human reason and our work as truth seekers prevail throughout this work. 
Their arrangement is balanced and reassuring. The subject matter, I'm not going to go through once again the deserters, vagabonds, transients, runaways, fugitives, slaves, higglers, renegades, pirates, bandits, buccaneers, freebooters, the colorful assortment of saucy and insubordinate characters, those with no known means of subsistence, and in as lackadaisical expression of class consciousness as I have ever heard, the disenchanted people casting about for a few new options. <laughs> Now well, these people studied the horizon, the doldrums, the evening breeze, the storm, the hurricanes, and the squalls, because <coughs> on the horizon is where the, their future lay. Now, Scott's geographical coordinates are equally unsettling. Though he is forced by the nature of the National Archive to deal with national boundaries, as Robin has pointed out, here is a subject matter that is, and here our language is not yet sufficient. It's international, it's cosmopolitan, it's pan-African, it's a working class, it's a multitude, it's a hydra. We, we're still working to define that force that can realize the, ob the revolutionary object of freedom. Um, and that force is the masterless people of the terraqueous world, we might say, but certainly <coughs> its beginning, I think, is in the Caribbean. So he'll talk about shallops, drogers, canoes, wherries, and harbor boats, and that islands are just stepping stones to freedom. The black presence of the sea is a phrase he permits himself. I say it that way, permits himself, to indicate to you the restraint and the punctilious exactitude of the man's search for truth. But it, in the background is always the sea, the choppy, turquoise, Winslow, Homer, Caribbean Sea, upon which ply vessels with sails swelled by the common wind. Okay. Halfway done. I'm trying to evoke the common wind as that subject. But now I want to introduce two other meanings of the common wind. The second one, let's go back to that sonnet. And I'll read to you the... Well, well the sonnet was in 1802. You know, that year of maximum enclosure acts, maximum slavery. That's Wordsworth, the founder of romantic poetry, writes this. Just the year before he wrote that, he wrote a po long poem called Michael, also in 1802. And it's about a man who lost his lands. He's a shepherd. And uh, he lost the fields, the hills, which were his living being even more than his blood. Fields where with cheerful spirits he had breathed the common air. Wordsworth was expressing the loss from enclosures as the common air, just as the same year he speaks of the common wind as a, of the freedom-seeking masterless slaves. So I want to join these two subjects, and we see them join in the first seven lines of that sonnet. Toussaint, the most unhappy man of men, whether the rural milkmaid by her cow sing in thy hearing, or thou liest now pillowed in some deep dungeon, earless den. O oh, miserable chieftain, where and when wilt thou find patience? Yet die not, do thou wear rather in thy bonds a cheerful brow. And then we're back to the first seven lines. Well, when people lost their land, the most important, this is now back in Europe, back in England in particular, where Wordsworth was writing. Next to gleaning, the most important common right was the possession, to use an Irish phrase, of a cow's grass. Because if she enjoyed the common rights, the gleaned grain and the cow's herbage, a commoner might have bread, milk, cheese, and once in a while roast beef. Whether the milkmaid by her cow sing in thy hearing. 
Wordsworth is gesturing not to a romantic ideal, but to a fact of common life, which is now being lost. So there, here is the proletariat of England and its creation at the moment that African-American slaves in the Caribbean are demanding freedom. Do we follow? There's, so there is my second meaning of the common wind. I want, to re, I want to refer to what we call the common lands. Because this is an era when the plantation moved from sugar production and exploitation of human beings to cotton. From the Caribbean to what is becoming the South. And who is organizing this? Just a couple months after the August, the August beating of the drums outside of Capacion. That Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of the Treasury, is recommending to Congress to move capital into cotton. That's right. You follow me? So I'm saying this about Hamilton. You mm -hmm. raised Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about how rule rules. I love that expression, unruly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are, okay. So, but we're dealing with a planetary force when we deal with wind, and whose direction and is uh, uh, affected by te temperature differentials, by the, by the rotation of the planet, by friction of topography. These were not fully understood at the time. Certainly they were better understood by shepherds and sailors than they were by so-called scientists. <laughs> but it's the scientists that leave the record and I was reading in Humboldt, who set off on his journey, and I think Julius taught me to see Humboldt as the first person to see Afro-America as part that went from Virginia down to Suriname and around Venezuela to see a great S of the Caribbean. This was Humboldt, who, who was studying heat in the thermodynamic age, in the age of... Uh, of the three laws of thermodynamic, don't, uh, we can save that for later, someone can explain it to me, <laughs> Ent entropy and all. But he developed isotherms, so he didn't see national boundaries, he saw temperature boundaries around the world. You know, he's developing environmental sciences, do you, do you follow me? Mm -hmm. And he's the one who sees that the earth is getting warmer. Because one of the consequences of using coal for warmth in city housing and for the steam engine was the augmentation of the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere where it still resides. And the global warming, the planetary warming under which people of the planet now are suffering, owes its origin to the era of the Haitian Revolution. And I want to see that subject that is described as the masterless people of help us to resolve in our freedom struggle these other two meanings of the commons. The commons of our stratosphere and the commons of land. That's, mm -hmm. So I have three meanings of, co of the common wind now. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. If you don't, uh, I, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Because we've got to figure it out. <laughs> and it lies in the future. I'm just talking about the past and a coincidence in the past, a coevality mm -hmm. between the pollution of the world of the of the air and the recovery of oxygen for our lungs is a work from below. That that is my theme. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Okay. I mean, that to me is the significance of the common wind. You know, I'm speaking now, like my historical work has breathed this dissertation in chapter 8 of the London Hanged, in our joint work of the many-headed hydra, in the work that uh, Marcus referred to, One Hot Globe, Hot Burning, or whatever the title is. Uh, it'll be out in the fall. What, what is it? Uh, Red Round Globe, Hot Burning. Ned and Kate in the struggle for the commons. Okay. What? Okay, Julius. Julius. So it began with Wordsworth, and the dissertation ends with William Wells Brown. Hmm. 
You remember Karl Marx in 1848, Communist Manifesto says that all that is solid will melt into air. Now in that same year, William Wells Brown wrote a book called, uh, what was it called? It was called, uh, here it is, I hope, it's, I hope I wrote it down. It's called The Anti-Slavery Harp. And it's full of airs, as the Irish call songs. All right. And one of those was the song of the Coffle Gang what Edward Baptist calls the human centipede of chained people marching. And they sang a song, See these poor souls from Africa transported to America? We are stolen, sold to Georgia. Will you, will you go along with me? We are stolen and sold to Georgia. Go sound the Jubilee. That's 1840, there's an air from 1848. Now, Martin Delaney, our Pittsburgh man, he publishes Blake 10 years later. I'd never read it until, inspired by you and, and this conference, I said, I better read this if I'm coming to Pittsburgh and, stop and see. And there's the story of a broken up family, a man and a woman trying to get together again. See wives and husbands torn apart. Their children's screams, they grieve my heart. They are torn away to Georgia. Come and go along with me. They are torn away to Georgia. Go sound the Jubilee. Oh, I was so happy. I mean, this is in print, but you know, I, I don't know the music to it. But it is clear, this same song from 1848 to 1859, now it's... And Jubilee, what, I'm gonna talk about Jubilee. I got a minute. Don't I? Yeah, a minute or two. <laughs> One. One minute. <laughs> yeah, all right, man. <laughs> Jubilee is sounded in the air, you know, the yobel, the Hebrew horn that sounds the Jubilee. You hear that? So that takes place in the medium of the air, in the medium of wind. That's one of its characteristics. It's got other characteristics. I won't go into them a whole lot, but it happens every now and then, every 50 years. That's the second characteristic. And it returns the land to, the, to, to its in, indigenous inhabitants. That's the third characteristic of Jubilee. And the fourth one that we all know uh, is the emancipation from slavery and from bondage. But there's also leaving the earth fallow. And finally, Jubilee requires zero work for a year. So it's calling for not only freedom, it's calling for rest. That's under a minute. There you go. just uh, thank you, Marcus, thank the uh, Pitt History Department. This is like a standing room only crowd. I'll get to go back and brag about this when I, when I, come back to, when I, when I, when I go back to Michigan. Um, uh, and they won't believe it. Um, and I'm very surprisingly surprised, pleased, an honor to be with you today and um, to have uh, this, this great discussion about um, my, some work that I did a few years ago and uh, I'm really glad that, that it's still current enough to talk about. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do today with, with you is uh, two things. I think Probably the second thing will probably not be as good as the first thing. The first thing is really, I'd like to, to, to just give you a couple of illustrations. One from the, from the actual book, The Common Wind. <clears throat> One that I've learned since mm -hmm. The Common Wind was done. That have to do with what I think, um, what I think the significance for maritime history. And I, I'm glad that that's the, 
theme this year of this seminar, uh, what, what I think the significance for, for, or get us to talk about the significance for maritime history of the common wind. And um, I'm not quite sure how I want to react to the, but I'll try to do that, of the uh, things that both Marcus and Peter have raised in their really great commentary. Thank you both very much for being here, for working on this, thinking about it seriously, mm -hmm. and presenting this to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is this is a great day for me, and I'm really I'm, I'm close to tears about mm -hmm. the things that have happened and, been, and that have been said today about my about my work. It's it's very it, 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 it it's very great to live through this at least one time in your life. <laughs> so it took me a few years to get to it, but I, I, I'm I'm glad that that's uh, that, that that that's a part of what I want to do. The first thing that the first illustration that I want to share with you comes from. September of 1791, just weeks after the first word of the Haitian Revolution beginning, uh, reached Jamaica, which is uh, a, 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 about a one-day canoe ride away from San Domingue. Um, and at this particular point in time, uh, a group of slaves in uh, Jamaica were reported to, apparently, have been thinking about ways in which they could further the resistance against slavery that was taking place in Jamaica. Um, a group of slaves decided that what they would do would be two things, to quote unquote fly to the woods, that is kind of a reference to maroon societies in Jamaica, go join the maroons somewhere, flying to the woods, really, what was about that. And from then to then, figure out ways to turn against whites and end slavery. One of, the, one of these slaves was, a, was a, a man named Duke. And uh, I happened to go to the university that was named after him. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and Duke said to the assembled slaves who were thinking about and considering different 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 forms of resistance, I want to I want to quote this. This may not be exactly what Duke said, but this is the way it came through in the documents. I guess I would have got to put my glasses on to look at it. And again, we're thinking about maritime history, and what Duke said was this: "Quote: While the whites were possessed of communication with the sea." the Negroes could do nothing. And that was partly a corrective that he was, that he was telling. It's not going to be quite as easy as we hope. And, and we live in a larger world, and there are larger forces besides. They were meeting because they'd been mistreated by their overseer on this absentee estate in Jamaica. But the world was bigger than that. And part of the thing was, we're, we're, we at some point are going to have to deal with the fact that the whites control not only the plantations mm -hmm. here in Jamaica, but communication with the sea, which may not have anything to do on a day-to-day -day basis with our estates, but it's something that we'll, that we'll come in contact with. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was such an interesting observation by Duke, and it really did speak to what one of the things that I wanted to accomplish in the common land, which was kind of the intellectual history of enslaved people. Didn't get too much of a feel of that, basically, when, when, I, when I first started this project. But here we have an individual who's really thinking about not only his individual, individual situation, but also has some sense of, of some vague sense anyway, of the, of the of the broader world that this that this uh, that his situation um, was connected to, mm -hmm. and again, I, I I sort of saw that again as a as a uh, a real statement about the intellectual history of enslaved people, which I think is part of what mm -hmm. what people think of as my hope my 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 um, book dissertation. Um, 
helping to refer to. Mm -hmm. So that, the, observation of, the observations of Duke are one of the things that I, that I want to talk about. And again, over the course of the next 10 years at least, in terms of the development of the Haitian Revolution, which was kind of complicated, communication with the sea was really a part of that. That's not always the way we think about the Haitian Revolution. We think about it, about it as being a revolution that takes place in a, in a particular place, mm -hmm. surrounded by the sea. But we don't think about the sea that often. I, was, I, I wrote uh, several years ago a piece that I called The Haitian Revolution at Sea, mm -hmm. which was really trying to say part of what we need to think about is what Duke is pulling our attention to, which is the larger context that has to do with the sea mm -hmm. and communication with the sea. And the common wind, obviously, is part of what helps us think about the, think about the sea as well. The second illustration I want to give, I have to kind of set it up a little bit, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, I, I apologize for this. Um, toward the end of the 1790s, um, Saint-Domingue was able to kind of occupy what was kind of a, a semi-quasi-independent status. That is, France abolished slavery. Um, and uh, there was the emergence in Saint-Domingue of black and brown leaders of different parts of the island. And they thought of themselves as, as loyal to the French, but independent from the French at the, at the same time. One of those leaders was Toussaint Louverture. One of those leaders was a person who became his kind of enemy in the South, a brown man named Andre Rigaud. Mm -hmm. And in 1796, Andre emissaries representing Andre Rigaud showed up in Cuba and asked permission from the lieutenant governor in Santiago de Cuba, in, in, in the Oriente West District of Cuba, the one really adjoining San Domingue, whether they could establish there a consulate to adjudicate the many prizes that vessels operating out of San Domingue were capturing. Mm -hmm. And they were very concerned. Wow, this brown man wants to start, ha have a consulate, and there's a way in which this is another more official um, uh, example of the same thing that Duke was talking about a little bit earlier. That is, communication with the sea was very important. And what was going to have to happen now was moving to the next stage, not just a slave rebellion in a particular place, but also extending that to other places. So having consuls and consulates in other places was, again, part of extending what this Haitian Revolution was, um, uh, was all about. In 1798, the British, who had occupied part of San Domingue for about five years, they demobilized their, their, um, their occupation and they made an agreement with Toussaint Louverture called the Convention, which gave a kind of reciprocal agreement with, with, between the British commander unauthorizedly and Toussaint Louverture, where he said, look, we'll leave you alone in, two, in, in, in San Domingue, stop trying to suppress the rebellion here, if you promise you won't try to start rebellion in the British territories. Mm -hmm. Toussaint Louverture agreed with that mm -hmm. thing. We'll have the revolution in one country as opposed to spreading it to other places. <laughs> now, there were other people who didn't agree with that. And so part of what took place after that was the, the struggle about, about that, still context here. So private individuals, for example, showed up in Jamaica and Cuba, trying to, people who are connected to San Domingue, trying to buy big ships mm -hmm. and vessels to extend the, uh, the boundaries of this, um, of this uh, revolution. Part of what this convention called upon was Toussaint Louverture to agree to certain conditions. So the conditions had to do with 
how far away from the coast ships with Sandal Man crews could go. So they, the British limited how far that could be. They limited the size of vessels. They had the same understanding of this that Duke was talking about. Communication with the sea was going to be the big thing now. Now that there's going to be a possibly an independent black country, part of what the independence is going to mean is people are going to be a bad and say, let's make sure we, we, um, we, 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 we keep that under wraps anyway. Mm -hmm. This is a big story that we could talk about a long time and I've, my cursory a presentation of it does not really do justice to it. The thing is, I wanted to get to this, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll have to quote, I'll have to quote this. <clears throat> British officials who were in San Domingo at the time talked about how interesting it was that this new regime that Toussaint Louverture was uh, in charge of, and again, we're talking about the, now we're talking about it, uh, talking about a more top-down as opposed to bottom-up um, thing here. And I ran across this at the British Archives. One individual said, one interesting thing about Toussaint is that, quote, he's very inquisitive to know the distance Saint-Domingue is from France and England and from, and also from Jamaica, Cuba, and other islands. That's a quote. In other words, here's Toussaint who's trying to do the same thing in a slightly more advanced setting than that Duke, that Duke was referring to back in 1791. He wants to know how long it takes you to get, mm -hmm. how long it takes you to get to France. How easy is it to get to New York? How easy is it to get to Jamaica? How easy is it to get to Cuba? What's, what's the distance? And there's, um, there's an individual named Marcus Rainsford yes. who in these years writes a, writes a, uh, a history of Sandal Mang that has parts that to do with his visits with, with Toussaint. And one of the things that, that Rainsford does is he draws a sketch of Toussaint Louverture. We don't really, we don't really have a he never really sat down for a portrait. We don't know exactly what he looked like. But he drew a sketch. The sketch led to an engraving based on it that, that I think we've all seen. Mm -hmm. And then this engraving, it's Toussaint with a big with a big hat with a with a with with a uh, red cockade coming out of it. And he's walking, he's very sharply dressed, and he's got over his arm a set of papers that don't look like print. And what in fact they might be is our, our maps. And again, it's speaking to the same observation that these British officials made about Toussaint being very interested in and thinking about, you know, the maritime situation of Saint-Domingue. And part of what takes place in Toussaint's last years are the struggle between his trying to figure out and again sending invoices to try to purchase vessels, sail canvas and other things that 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 suggest to the enemies of this that there's some kind there's some kind of maritime adventure at sea mm -hmm. that he's considering and thinking about. But no, he's he's really just trying to 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 do what an independent nation does, which is Establish itself not only at home but abroad, mm -hmm. and that is going to have to, as it turns out, involve some change in the prospects of what Duke in 1791 called communication with the sea. And I think I, I wish I had had time when I wrote The Common Wind, to spend more time talking about this ladder. I kind of referred to it in the end, but didn't really have a chance to talk about it very deeply. Um, but I think this is, a, this is a very interesting part of the Haitian Revolution that we should really try to 
think about yeah. as we think about the uh, the uh, considerable history that's made within the art within the colony itself, right. but also to think about the ways in which these uh, these um, things extended out. So that that's really what I, what I wanted to hopefully contribute to. We can talk about it. Contribute to the. Uh, to maritime history, mm -hmm. that the Haitian Revolution is also a part, very much a part, of maritime history, and should be and should be uh, should be thought of that way. Mm -hmm. It's something we don't always consider when we think about the Haitian Revolution. We think about it as taking place in one area, mm -hmm. somewhere down in the Caribbean. But it's it, at least there's people trying to push it, um, to push it forward. Um, oops, sorry, okay. sorry. I'm not really quite sure what I can say. I'm not quite as, I'm not as quick as I used to be um, about, uh, about the great commentary of Peter and, uh, and, uh, and Robin. I want to thank both of them again for, for, for participating here and for contributing to our um, uh, contributing to our knowledge. Um, <clears throat> I look, got to look, look over my notes here. Um, the 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 concept and idea of masterlessness was something I, that I kind of took from a book. Again, a book I read in graduate school called "The World Turned Upside Down" by Christopher Hill. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it's, it's, it's about it's about early modern England, something that something that that, that that I didn't know anything about. But one of the chapters in Christopher Hill's book is a chapter about people being pushed off or leaving the land and come to cities. It's called masterless men, and I thought quite an interesting quite an interesting concept with some real different resonances to be applied to the mm -hmm. Caribbean, where the master-slave relationship is really the part of what defines these various places. Right. But there's, as Robin pointed out, there's a really important, small, pretty small group of people who are falling with falling outside that master-slave relationship. Mm -hmm. We think about the master-slave relationship as being primary, and it is. But there's a lot of people. They're sailors. They're mm -hmm. They're runaway slaves. They're mm -hmm. they're they're higglers and traders and people that speak different languages that are moving from place to place, and that's a different a different um, or I perceive that as being a different window into the way the Caribbean works than is than the one that we normally um, think about, mm -hmm. and so that concept of masterless people. Was really a, a very important, a, a very important thing that, you know, again, was something I had to come up with. That's part of my dissertation, but it has it, it has really had a great a great important effect on the way people who've been influenced by the, the common women um, have uh, have talked about. And learn about um, the thing is <clears throat> these these as important as the master slave relationship is to the way these societies work because partly because they're islands or because they are on 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 sea coasts they can't really function without people who are outside the master-slave relationship. They've got to have ships come. You know, you, you, if you, you, uh, unless ships show up with stuff, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And ships have to come from somewhere, and they've got people on the on those vessels that that are going back and forth that aren't really part of this master-slave relationship. They are they're masterless, and they're dealing with masters, but. In in uh, in um, in some different ways, the only way these places can survive is by at least some some group of these individuals 
who who move back and forth, move products back and forth, move food back and forth, and part of that movement also can involve ideas and concepts, and so there 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 are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, examples of that that I found that. I thought related to this broader world of um, of um, of the masterless. I do appreciate Peter. You you know more. I'm, you know know more about this than I do. But I do appre appreciate your um, attention to the title. And to thinking about the common wind, the reference mm -hmm. in the sonnet by Wordsworth as really more than just a uh, an image that he's projecting. I'm not sure I did that in the in the common wind. I, I didn't really, and I and and again, it's, it's something that in looking back on it, I, I kind of regret. I didn't really spend as much time um, massaging that image through the course of the narrative as I, as I, as I might have to make it more effective um, and to use it. Because, you know, it's, a, it's, it's kind of an image, that it, 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 and I'm in the image category now, it's kind of an image about conversation and mouth and mouth mouth-to-mouth -mouth communication. It's also a sailing image. Mm. It, 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 it's an image that, that, that has a wide degree of usage that I didn't really avail myself of when, when, I, when, I, uh, when, I, when I wrote The Common Wind. But yeah, but you demonstrated, though. I, de I, demonstra you demonstrated, I demonstrated, yeah. The, the, the yeah. self-activity of all those people. The self yes, yeah. yes. The, I, 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 <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I, I, I do hope that I, that I managed to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't clear to me when I, you know, it wasn't like when I was writing this, I was saying, wow, this is a big classic that I'm writing here. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to write a dissertation, man. Get out of graduate school. You know, <laughs> you know the, the, I, I had a teacher who said, the, the one thing about graduate school is you got to get out of it. That's the main... That's the main object of being in graduate school and moving past graduate school, and 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 I, and I was doing that, mm -hmm. but I did sometimes feel when I was doing it that wow, this is pretty, this is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is fitting, this is fitting together in, 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 in ways that that I like. Of course, I just hoped my advisor liked it when I when I when I, when I, when I sent things off to him, and that and that was really. Um, Nothing could be more surprising than, and it's surprising to me, than the reception mm -hmm. of this. I got a letter from an editor at Verso who said, your dissertation has a pretty distinguished history as an unpublished manuscript. Wow, that really brought a tear to my eyes. You know, mm -hmm. you know that's really... That's, re that's, really, that's really true. I'm blessed that that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that happened. What else I got I have, I think, understandably, always thought, you know, one of the big failures in my life was I didn't turn my dissertation into a book. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. And I didn't do that. And, you know, because of that, you know, I'm a lecturer, not a professor. And now that my career is kind of m moving to an end, I've said, well, that's, you know, that's something that happened in the past. I didn't do it. I'm, and now I'm going to move on to another phase of my life. But it's just my blessing that the common win now is is going to be published mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. i can't i i can't express how how uh how uh how happy that's made me mm -hmm. in an unexpected way i think at christmas time i still didn't even know about this it it, mm -hmm. it, it, it it's been 
a, a sudden change. Now I'm giving talks and stuff now. <laughs> I thought that was all behind me. I thought that was, that was all over. Wow. And, I, and I was thinking I'm turning to a new phase in my life now where I'm going to be at home all the time. But, uh, but uh, That's great. my brother had, I had to invite my brother to come from Atlanta to actually help me find my my copy of the common <laughs> which, 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 which which was in a box somewhere of things from the office, and I had we had to go through it, and uh, and uh, at some point he said, I think I think I found it. Here it is, and so it took it took us a couple of days, but this has really been a surprise mm -hmm. to me, and 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 great, yeah. and wow, a, a big crowd coming out. It, 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 I can't really describe how how uh, how how nice this is. Everybody should go through it <laughs> at, at, at least one time. Everybody should, everybody should go through it. It's just been really great. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. with an unpublished dissertation, I say right on. <laughs> uh, makes me proud that you're having such a good time today. Um, yeah, this goes back to Peter, and because we're all educators here in one way or another, mm -hmm. and this idea of the search for truth and going back to Hamilton, because the biggest mass history lesson we've all gotten is the play Hamilton, right. that in order to make him seem, I don't know, less reactionary or um, more palatable to the public, they've used as actors to play the white slave-owning mm -hmm. um, founders, the descendants of these mm -hmm. masterless people. Mm -hmm. So are there any comments on that? I mean, why do you... I just, I think it's just an odd moment. It, it's that mm -hmm. somehow Mm -hmm. a victory for those people in that mm. to sort of sell this to the public at this moment we have to actually change the complexion of the cast. Mm. Mm. I haven't seen it, so I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen it either. Nobody can see yeah. it. <laughs> I, I, I think it's hard to see it. Um, but I have to say, for, 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 from, from my remote p point of view, that was pretty neat. I thought that 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 that, that Hamilton and other people around him were being played by people of color. That was that was really unusual, and I thought neat. You know, I I, I haven't seen the actual production to know where that went, but you know, I have been I have been impressed as well with uh, with people. Associated with Hamilton, who've been interviewed in, in, in other contexts, and you know the kind of the political roles that, that that they've chosen to play in the world since Hamilton has been up on the stage, mm -hmm. and because Hamilton's been up on the stage, um, I've also been rah rah about that as well. Um, um, so yeah, it 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 it's uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting world turned upside down in some ways that uh, that. Uh, that Hamilton, the play, um, represents, and again, that's just me talking as a person who hadn't seen it, but who's uh, but, but, but who's impressed by the people who are engaging in that upside down turning. I've got a young woman. Uh, she's in. She's now in ninth grade. She's asking me about Hamilton, and I told her to read the report to the, on banking, report on <laughs> pointing, <laughs> on, on, on manufacturing mm -hmm. and, and I took my own advice and, and began to learn about the investment of money from sugar into cotton. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm looking underneath. I like these, the appearance. I think it's a perfect symbol for me of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it is. Bringing a partial victory of multiculturalism 
to the stage, mm -hmm. but covering up mm -hmm. the fundamental relationships mm -hmm. of, uh, of the USA, of a class system. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Robin? <laughs> yeah, I've got plenty over here. Um, no, but we, we did, I recently did a panel on Hamilton, and um, I guess you could look at it in two different ways. If you see it as um, an attempt to take a narrative that people are really not very familiar with <coughs> and make it a story about contemporary mm -hmm. immigration politics, mm -hmm. then in that way it, it actually kind of works. In other words, there's there's a lot of things that you can see in those performances that speak to the present, or at least to the last 20 years. Mm. If you read it as, because you know, when you, because actually you don't need to see the play. All you gotta do is get the soundtrack, because mm -hmm. the soundtrack is the play. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else but the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you listen to the lyrics, some of, some of them actually do make some interesting references. When you have like Thomas Jefferson, you know, all people of color, um, making references to Thomas Jefferson's penchant for Sally Hemings or for black women, uh, kind of as a side joke, it changes the dynamics when these are like black and brown bodies. In other words, it takes the edge off. It, it removes, in other words, the structure of white supremacy disappears altogether. And then... Um, so is that, is that a good, is that a good thing? That's not a good thing. thing. Okay. I, was, I was trying to say it's, it's sort of not, like this is the bad, this is the, mm -hmm. the, the flip side. And I think what Peter's saying is right. If, when you send students to actually figure out who Hal Alexander Hamilton is and who Thomas Jefferson is, um, who any of these characters are, it changes. And then you realize he's not an immigrant. He's a British subject, no matter what. And he's, in other words, to, to construct him as this poor, struggling Puerto Rican when he's actually himself, even though he was an orphan, although he was part of a, a class that has class mobility. B born in the Caribbean. Right, right, born in the Caribbean, but he has mobility by virtue of mm -hmm. his European mm -hmm. origins. Mm -hmm. That mobility matters. Mm -hmm. And if you have a whole generation of people think that, oh no, that doesn't matter, mm -hmm. then it, it has a different valence and mm -hmm. it can do a different kind of thing. But again, that's two different that's readings good. of it. Mm -hmm. And this, the first reading is one that have been, has inspired a lot of people. Mm -hmm. in, in positive ways. The second one, not so much. So we, let's take maybe three questions and then we'll try to respond to them. Rishi? Well, I really appreciated this. Mm -hmm. This was like really enriching. So um, I'm actually interested in Dr. Kelly's like reference to Sylvia Winter right. because I agree with you on a lot of what you said about this. But I think that what's interesting about what I hear in Dr. Lambaugh's kind of like comment about the commonness of the communication is that when Winter talks about like a new humanism, when right. she says like "phenom" means in, you know, in putting freedom like an invention into existence, right? How is, do you think that there is a way in which you can read this kind of oral communication as like a ethical relation of humanism and then how can that like, or reinvention of it, and how can, that, can we kind of like see that in our contemporary moment where we all kind of denigrate new media and social media and right. we say like, oh my God, it just makes me a worse person, when in fact you can have this kind of like creation of the commons of information. Right, right. Just, just to be clear, um, I wasn't critiquing Sylvia Winter. Yeah, no. In fact, I, I argue that Sylvia Winter is not yeah, alpha pessimism. And in fact, it's precisely because of her Caribbean standpoint mm -hmm. that, because she's very much about the uh, interesting way of thinking about creolization, you know, that the new humanism she's talking about is one a recognition of how the human was invented as, as, mm -hmm. as sort of European man and what that excludes. But then new humanism is about overthrowing. And that, I think, Fanon too. That Fanon also pushed for new humanism, but that's another part of Fanon that's not being read mm -hmm. as much. But I do think that in some ways, to go back to the, the ultimate part, the bottom part of the question, which is the, uh, the question of media, right? Mm -hmm. New media as a mode of, uh, of new identity, I think that potential is always there. I guess I put always less stock in, um, in the technologies mm -hmm. of the process. So, so when you think about, like, to go back to the 1790s, mm -hmm. um, there were technologies, mm -hmm. print media, other forms of technology, the, the ship, mm -hmm. um, and, it, and so the technologies, the same technologies that were used to spread the word of republicanism, a radical republic, it was the same technologies that were used to suppress it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So I would say that it's not the technology so much as much as how do we come to the sort of that moment of rupture. So it's kind of like looking for the cracks and the shocks that we can find in within like the networks we create. Right, and but it's it's really I think it has more to do with here than the than the, yeah. the machine, and and the thing about Sylvia Winter, which I think is so there's so many things that's genius about her, is that she she did see the world from one of the most um, the place that has the most global traffic, the Caribbean. <laughs> And that's how she, she under, that's how she understood her critique of the West, of Enlightenment thought. That's how she understood Black studies. That's how she understood, um, uh, you know, what what does New Humanism look like? So I think her location and her relationship to that, and to the social movements that shaped her, because she's very much part of the Caribbean arts movement. I mean, there's a lot of things going on that shaped it. And so, so if you go back to contemporary media, social media to me. Um, could have all its potential liberating elements, but it's also one of the most destructive things I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, just... Yes, so... so Quickly, I, because Ron has yeah, got to yeah. get to the airport. So, um, yes. I'm, not, I'm not an historian, I will demonstrate it with my question, so dear patients with mm -hmm. me. Um, and actually, it's connected to this. Uh, first of all, it's very interesting how, um, to me, I've been very interesting how the internet, for instance, as a very much a maritime language embedded in mm -hmm. it, like mm -hmm. web websites, surfing mm -hmm. through web, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and it's interesting how the same type of work toward um, enclosure of the internet itself is happening uh, right now in the same way in which it was happening in, in, in the past century. And, and the question is, is precisely on how we do we define something that is worth spreading news, right? So we, we have now exactly the opposite uh, problem in which all the news can actually be accessed mm -hmm. very very suddenly mm -hmm. and in, immediately. Mm -hmm. And the medium itself is, uh, it, it, it's a problem per se, I mean, besides the fact that it's going to come, come to the question. Privatizing. So mm -hmm. how, how, how is the, that passion that those news were spreading were actually Driven, driven someone. How can we f find it in nowadays world, in which it seems that everything is over in overload? Mm -hmm. You talking to me? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what, what question. was the question again? That question to me. <laughs> what is that? How do, the, the, how do you take that passion? Because you think about the, the 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 metaphors or analogies to the maritime world, surfing the internet, you know, enclosure. These kinds of things. How do you take that passion and translate it? In other words, yeah. basically, that your talk. I, I think uh, we we a we've done that before your eyes today. B, <laughs> we've got the, we have a scholar who has shown how it's done in the past. And C, I'll quote Bertolt Brecht, that uh, the old ignorance is passed by new technologies. Wisdom is passed by word of mouth. Mm. 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 Well, that's, that's so, a, I got yeah, one more, one more question. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just kind of, you know, there's a lot of commenting, comments <coughs> seeping through the conversation. Peter, you kind of hinted at the comments just a little bit during your uh, prophecy there. Um, I just wanted to talk about what happens in Haiti after the revolution right. that gets spread because, you know, you mentioned that you know a maritime state. Uh, Terry aqueous space like Haiti can't really exist without the outside. But what strikes me, what strikes me about Haiti is that they really build a sort of self-sufficient agrarian mm -hmm. republic that mm -hmm. even centralized authoritarian leaders can mm -hmm. repress. To Toussaint tries to reinstate the plantation system mm -hmm. and fails. Mm -hmm. uh, right. The PK rebellion of 1844 uh, almost overthrows the government of Revere Herard, and there's just this really sense of connecting to the land and rebuilding the commons. Mm -hmm. Is that something that gets transmitted, do you think, in further subsequent generations, say, in the history of the Civil War and the general strike of slaves in that period? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or in other ways, I don't know, I'm just curious your thoughts. Yeah, I, I, my, my meager understanding of the, of the post-revolution, post-revolutionary Haiti, um, <laughs> It's pretty pessimistic. Right. My, my, you know, my, my, mine is. I mean, it, it basically what I think what a couple of things happened. One, one of which is to get 
to get recognized by France, they've got to give up, you know, tens of millions of dollars of gold to to uh, to acquire that. And in order to do that, they are they end up really trying to revive a plantation system that most people don't want to be in, and that's that's part of what <clears throat> part of what the agrarianism is that takes place really has to do with a kind of exploitation of that that's that's uh, that's kind of negative. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got a you know when you when you look at the 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 the, uh, the you know Sans Souci and you know the big fort that's built. At the uh, um, which which you, which you can go 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 to visit today, part of that really really means that a disproportionate amount of their internal wealth really really got contributed to rightly or wrongly absolutely defense of because they really did expect it that that someday all the white folks are going to get together and come and reestablish labor here right and that's that's so that's that's kind of part of what. what what happened afterwards? Right. Um, can can I add just a couple of just to in some specifics? So the amount of money that France that, that Haiti ended up paying France in indemnity comes out to twenty one billion dollars mm. in mm. two thousand four dollars, and a lot of that wasn't just raiding the coffers; it was that French banks financed the indemnity. So they basically gave loans to pay back and then got the interest. Mm -hmm. um, and then after you, and they paid it back. The amazing thing is that Haiti paid mm -hmm. it back. Mm -hmm. After all that, they paid it back and then the U.S. invades. Mm -hmm. And then they steal the money. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Peter, Peter Hudson has this book, Bankers and Empire, which is about like what happens after 1915. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is incredibly pessimistic, but it speaks exactly to the point of the whole book of you've got to watch out for the sea. Mm -hmm. Because the sea may be the space that you're trying to build your liberation, but there's also the hostile forces that have basically just, just stolen from Haiti, constantly and consistently. And you can't have that revolution in one country. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. so Julius is absolutely right. So much of the internal dynamics, what becomes the, the, the a class struggle between Haitian peasants who are trying to, to get the land back, in the form of production that's commodity production for the outside world or food production in internal markets that are falling apart um, was under the duress of global capital throughout the 19th and 20th century. Mm -hmm. you know? So pay if you pay $21 billion in reparations to Haiti, things might be a little different. Mm -hmm. and, and let us, let us remember this history of massive reparations for slaveholders. Absolutely. In both Britain and France. I mean, this is something that is all too often forgotten. We, we, we have to stop at this point, but let me just say one thing in, in conclusion. Um, I really have appreciated the way in which this session has been about not only the past, the brilliant past that Julius has evoked, but also uh, the present and the future. Mm -hmm. And so I would like to refer to a, a person who appears in Julius's book. This is a, uh, a man who ran away from slavery, uh, and he gave himself a name that we can all use as we go out of this room. He called himself Without Fear. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to all of you for coming. <laughs>